I've been really fortunate that asset prices have increased, rents have increased. There's been plenty of mistakes and obstacles along the way, but we've been fortunate to be in a really good market. So we've got to be humble about that going forward into yes. 2023. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Grace Shockey. This is Elliot Hallam, and we are here to talk about some of Elliot's investments, and we just wanted to share a little bit more with the Ren community about his history and what he's working on and what he's excited about. So, hi. Hey, Grace. Hey, Thanks Elliot. for having me. Yeah. Uh, first podcast, so probably going to say something that I'll later regret, but we're going to roll with it. We're going to roll with it. Yeah. I, it's going to be okay. <laughs> I believe in Ren so much. It's helped me get started in real estate. And I've been doing it for about 10 years now. You've been doing Ren or real estate? So I, jo I joined Ren 10 years ago and uh, started buying rental properties because mm -hmm. that's what they say to do in Rich Dad, Poor Dad yes. was to get passive income. And that was something I'd always been looking for. At the time, I was working in the farm business in McMinnville. Oh, really? What and were you doing? In farm work. Uh, so I have a horticulture degree. My parents have a tree farm and a plant nursery. Cool. And uh, would come to the Wren meetings in, in Nashville from McMinnville. And anytime I meet a Wren member who is traveling a great distance, I know they're definitely motivated and they're probably going to be successful yep. in that they, they want it really badly. Yep. So I wanted the autonomy. I wanted the time freedom, the mm. four hour work week kind of lifestyle where I could work when I want to and and have some location freedom as well. And I'm certainly on that path. Okay. And um, attempting to acquire more rental property income over time. Awesome. And uh, I got my real estate license in 2015 and was fortunate that it was a really good time to be a realtor mm -hmm. during the past seven, eight years. And with that being said, I've always, when I mentioned to you about wealth building, I've always tried to make my commission income and put that towards real estate. Mm. as best I can not spend that money necessarily on your lifestyle yeah on lifestyle try to keep a low lifestyle and that's something yeah. I also learned from rich dad poor dad playing the the cash flow board game when mm -hmm. you get the janitor character you have the lowest expenses mm -hmm. so you're able to get out of the rat race more quickly and that really spoke to me as a a farm worker in that I didn't make very much money mm -hmm. but I was definitely happy and content with that lifestyle right McMinnville versus Nashville yeah. I mean yeah. that cost of living is Pretty Exa different. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, moved to Murfreesboro in 2012 and started buying rental properties mm -hmm. and do just doing the vanilla, boring 30 year fixed rate mortgages, saving up down payment money. And this was before kind of you got licensed, right? Correct. Yes. Okay. So I've always tried to be an investor first and a realtor second. And I was fortunate in that it was such good timing to get into real estate as a as an affiliate broker mm -hmm. in 2015 that there were plenty of people moving to Nashville that needed my help. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't necessarily looking for that, but after a year or two I I realized I just need to do this full time. So yeah, yeah went went full time in 2015 and uh, was kind of unbankable for a couple of years really? because I, I didn't have a, a job. Yeah. I was working for myself. So again, I was just trying to do my best to accrue as much. So when you say unbankable, you mean you couldn't get any kind of loans? I could have like, gotten private loans yeah. and hard money loans based yeah. on the asset, but not based on uh, bank money. Mm -hmm. Thirty. I can relate to that. You know what I mean? Realtor. Oh yeah. yeah. I actually just bought my first one like mm -hmm. two months ago because I just hit my two, two year and some change mark and they finally were like, great, we'll give you a loan. Yeah, that's so awesome. I totally understand. Yeah, yeah, congrats on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So it, um, with that being said, I've always felt like I need to be very humble about the fact that I've just been in a really good market mm -hmm. the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. I've been really fortunate that asset prices have increased, rents have increased. There's been plenty of mistakes and obstacles along the way, but we've been fortunate to be in a really good market. So we've got to be humble about that going forward into yes. 2023 and as REN members that the market may change, but we'll certainly change tactics. But overall, the strategy remains the same, that we're going to continue to build wealth mm -hmm. and generate more passive income, keep our expenses under control, just keep a, a basic kind of approach to real estate investing. I love that. Um, that makes me curious. What are your thoughts about like the future of the market? I mean, clearly you want to stay humble and you want to like keep your nose down and keep working, but... Uh, a lot of people are kind of afraid right now. What would you say to that? I think there's always opportunity. Mm -hmm. I read articles that are shared in the REN Facebook group, and we also do a monthly market update for REN members or anybody watching this that's free to anyone can Is that can like a Zoom, Zoom call? Yeah, it's a Zoom call. We typically have it on Thursday nights once a month, and I share lots of articles. 
I'm definitely a news junkie. I subscribe to too many newspapers. But I think that also yeah. serves me as a realtor, too, just knowing what's going on yeah, in the it, local it market does. as well as, as nationally with Wall Street Journal, things like that. And I think that there's going to be opportunities, but is the market going to crash? I don't think it's going to, here at least. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion here is that unless lots of people go unemployed, there's not going to be a tremendous amount of distressed property or distressed mm -hmm. sales. That being said, prices did peak last year. Oh, yeah. Homes, home prices are going down slowly. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I uh, had a listing go under contract this weekend, and the seller started the price higher than some of the competition, and it took 75 days or so to go under contract. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. 75 days or so to go under contract. But they ultimately, I think they're getting about 3 or 4% more for their their home than they would have if they had just immediately started at a lower price. Interesting. And that's not what we've been doing as realtors. No. We've, we've always kind of been taught, you know, put it at the price it should sell for. Mm -hmm. Whereas this seller was thinking, I want to get tw 2021 price or 2022 yeah. price. And uh, they had already moved out of the home. So it wasn't like having an open house every week wasn't a big bother to them and they were in no hurry. So an interesting observation there. But hmm. yeah, my... My personal thesis is as long as people keep moving to Middle Tennessee, we have one of the highest net migrations in Middle Tennessee mm -hmm. that it stinks for people who don't make a lot of money. They're just going to have to buy further out, like in a McMinnville, yes. or Shelbyville, mm -hmm. Manchester, Tullahoma. Springfield is still pretty affordable. Yeah. Yeah. You can still get, I would say, within 45 minutes where it's affordable mm -hmm. for most people. Yeah, and that's such a charged word yeah. because people coming into our market, they see Green Hills, Brentwood. Yeah. Wow, that's an affordable for, Even for, what, for yeah, some people. Yeah, for what you get. So But to locals or uh -huh. people from similar markets, yeah. it's like woof. The out of state money has forever changed the mm -hmm. middle Tennessee real estate market. And that's there's nothing we can do about that. There's just so many positives to why companies are moving here and high net worth individuals are moving to Middle mm -hmm. Tennessee. So we have to take what factors are out there and look for opportunities. So with, with looking at real estate investing, I think you're always looking for vacant property. You're looking for motivated sellers. Mm -hmm. And right now, it seems like there's not as many foreclosures as there have been in the past. People are doing what they can to keep and hold on to their property or they're selling it yep. before they would go into foreclosure. Yep. So with that being said, I'm just always driving around looking for distressed property. And it seems like there's more of that in the small towns. Mm -hmm. So in about 2018, I started making a shift where instead of buying in Nashville or buying in Murfreesboro, start looking at the towns that are a little bit further out. Mm. And McMinnville would be an example. There's plenty of dilapidated homes in McMinnville. They just have to be bought at a discount that makes sense. Right. And all too often, most people, they still want more than uh, what mm -hmm. an investor is willing to pay and good for them. You know, I hope they get that. I it, think most Tennesseans, to your point, have heard, you know, the 2020 to 2022 market stories and they're like, wow, I want a piece of that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are still some people that are realistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also people inherit property. Probate is always a, yeah. a, a lead tactic. Uh, people that have had a death in the family or something like that, they get a property that's a problem to them. We as REN members, real estate investors, we have to be problem solvers. For sure. So we're helping people get out of a bad situation and being able to move on because that property had become a burden. So that's how I try to look at when I'm talking to a seller or talking to a wholesaler is we're, we're trying to make it a win-win like you, you said earlier, mm -hmm. where you were, you're kind to let me come on this podcast oh, yeah. with you and we can honor Ren and, mm -hmm. and all those things. So uh, um, question, question yeah, about ahead. what you just said, uh, how are you specifically tapping into that? Like the um, probate you know, foreclosures, anything. Like, do you have specific strategies that you're looking at to meet those people? I am really bad at following up with sellers <laughs> and things like that. That's not my best place. I have a lot of relationships with wholesalers mm -hmm. and also people I'll meet at Ren who might be newer mm -hmm. and might need help with an opportunity that they have come upon. Mm -hmm. So we might work together on that or I might be a money lender to them or just an advice where they can do everything themselves and hopefully avoid some expensive mistakes Yeah. so that they can do their first deal that way. So it sounds like it's more of um, the network Definitely. inside the investor yeah. circle this that's is a great these deals. This is a great opportunity to plug Ren, the mm -hmm. real estate investor in Nashville, about building relationships. That's yeah. the most important thing you're going to get at Ren. That was something I wanted to ask you about yeah. today. How has that impacted your career? 
It's something that you have to get to know somebody over weeks, months, years at a time, go into as many meetings as you could. Mm -hmm. When I was new, I would try to go to everything. Now with the family, I try to go to a couple every month and be intentional. Mm -hmm. I really like the the networking lunches. There's lots of people that come and go. Do you go to all of them around? No, I don't go to all of them, but I try to go to Nashville and I go to the Murfreesboro one. Nice. With that being said about building relationships, that's what we do as realtors, as investors, as capitalists, is we have to honor people and and help them solve their goals so we get more of what we want. There's a Zig Ziglar quote about if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. Mm -hmm. And that's something that... Uh, it didn't happen when I was new at Wren, but now sometimes the phone just rings. It's mm-hmm. somebody at Wren who's got a property, for instance, like in Milton, Tennessee, or Auburn Town, Tennessee, which is a little bit more rural that they don't know who else to call. They're looking for advice on what should I do with this. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm happy to hop on calls like that because, you know, it might be an opportunity for me or at, at worst, I'm just helping them get to the next step on their deal. So they'll call me on the next time they have something they might want to sell. And I might be the first call. Yeah, 100%. And mm-hmm. as a realtor, you know, referrals are a huge part of our business. too. Yes. So even if you don't directly work with them, they're going to be grateful for that help and that mm-hmm. insight. So you never know how it could come back. When I was new at Wren, the number one reason why I came to Wren was I wanted to learn how to analyze property. Mm. That was something that I was reading in books about investing, about getting deals, like what is a deal and how do you ascertain value and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that was something I looked for quickly at Wren and got what I need. Where did you find that? Did you find that in like the breakout sessions on the main nights or did you just talk to people? Talk to people, uh, Saturday classes Mm -hmm. that were offered, uh, subscribed to some software at the time. I wasn't a realtor, so I had a CRS, courthouse retrieval Mm -hmm. system. Uh, subscription nowadays you can look on zillow and some of the other websites you get pretty much everything you need a lot of investors use prop stream mm-hmm. if they're not licensed uh, all those things and sometimes that's when people are calling me they're they're ultimately asking me like elliot is this a deal elliot is this something i should keep working on all too often the last couple of years has been like unfortunately no i don't think it is it's it's a little too expensive if one thing happens that doesn't go your way you're out you're gonna you're gonna lose money on this and there's nothing worse than doing a renovation or a new construction project where you realize months or years before it's done that you're not going to make any money. And I've been there. Really? And I, and I don't want anybody to to have to feel that because it's it's really uncomfortable. But I was going to ask, do you feel comfortable sharing like one of your boo-boos to sure, help people? Sure. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I made was back in uh, 2017, I, I bought some land from a wholesaler in East Nashville where I kind of trusted them that they knew mm. what they were doing and I should have done more due diligence on upfront, like me personally talking to Metro Development and getting more information on what you can and can't do with the property. Mm. And uh, it turned into a really painful learning experience. And the biggest thing, that was luck in my favor was the market appreciated so rapidly that if you held land over the last four, five, six, seven years, you've made money just land banking. Yeah, and especially in East Nashville. Yeah, so that's something that ultimately the project was a positive, but for years it was a negative. And so was, how did you cover the note or did you just pay it? I just had to pay out of pocket. Yeah. And, you know, like I had a construction loan in place with, with a bank to, mm-hmm. to build homes, but we went... 35% over budget. So that just had to come out of my reserves. And this is a great time to talk about you. You must have reserves as, oh, yeah. a, as an investor. Sure. Yeah. And also as just somebody that whether you own real, real estate properties now or later, but you have to be able to budget with your wealth building so that you're always saving money for when bad things happen because they will happen. Mm-hmm. And, and it's when you least expect them. Yep. So definitely right now, I'm personally positioned with reserves so that opportunities come along, I'll be able to capitalize on those and, mm. and buy them either with, you know, bank financing or, or private or hard money. And, and, when, and, and when you say reserves, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. when you say reserves, you mean your personal reserves or what you're making from your properties or both? I would consider it uh, both. Yeah. Always you want to have plenty of cash flow if you have a rental property. Mm-hmm. But with I, I would never have a rental that was geared negative, that was yeah. you know costing me money every month. That's just not something personally I'd want to do. I think you're talking about speculation when you're looking at gearing a property negative. But mm-hmm. I could see people doing it on a short-term basis for some bigger goal, perhaps. But otherwise, yeah, I just try to always have some reserves in case there's a problem. Or, heaven forbid, you renovate or build a property and it sells for less than you thought it would. Mm-hmm. It, it You don't want to get wiped out. Yeah. Another story that was a big mistake, my first rental property, I uh, 
didn't realize that there were going to be financing problems with an appraisal and stuff. So made a lot of mistakes with that. And fortunately, mm -hmm. uh, came through on that one too with some help from other oh, really? REN members. And the, the thing that I want to share is you've got to make sure like if you have a spouse is you don't want to mess up on one of your first deals. They won't let you do another one. Fair enough. You guys heard him. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of skepticism from my yeah. spouse again, because I had a farm background. I wasn't a, uh, I, I, I didn't have a real estate degree or anything like that. I was just taking lots of classes and, you and studying. When you first started. Exactly. So. Yeah. So that's something where, uh, in order to build trust with your, your family and stuff like that, you need to have, you need to make your first couple deals be wins mm -hmm. and be successes. And that's what, again, where Ren comes in so helpfully is that you can see other people and what they're doing and ask them questions and they'll be telling you how not to do it. Yeah. Which that's how I would, if someone were to try to do a, a land development right now and they're not a big development company, I would find ways to talk them out of it really right now just because of the time it, it might take mm -hmm. or the obstacles the city can put in there that you don't know that the city's going to put that obstacle in there but mm -hmm. that's just how development goes is there's kind of a uh, a wild card in in yes. that respect so development is not for the faint of heart so that that'd be something i would caution uh, a, an investor one-to-one -one on 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 that kind of thing i've seen some interesting stories on that like uh, even my, so my boyfriend does uh, commercial real estate. He had a deal under contract when we met in 2020 in Murfreesboro with a church. And then the HOA got kind of grabby on their side of the land. And they were saying like this little median strip was their land. So they were stopping the sale and it's lasted our entire relationship, which is almost three years and it's going to go to court now. So there is, yeah, there's a lot of things. And, and I think this was an experienced developer, but that's a great recommendation don't get it in over your head on your first one. Oh, for sure yeah that that's something that de i think development is the most uh difficult but also it could it could work out where it's it's a huge profit in the end mm -hmm. and now i understand why developers make a lot of money is the risk that you take mm -hmm. with those kind of things so i feel your pain I've, I've experienced some of those and when you don't expect that it can be debilitating because mm -hmm. it makes you not want to take risk but we have to take calculated risk as investors if we want to grow mm. our portfolio. That's super important. And you still feel like people need to be taking calculated risks in 2023 and going forward. I, as long as the, the investment, the property has looks like it would rent mm -hmm. for more than like what your debt service would be or if it's an acceptable return if you're buying with cash. One, one thing I heard somebody say at Ren when I was newer is you need to have two exit strategies. Mm. So if you're like renovating a house, be sure you could rent the house as well yep. in case it didn't sell. So thinking along that lines, I think we could talk about this uh, renovation project I'm working on where it was a vacant car wash building mm. and just driving around Middle Tennessee, which I do. I saw where uh, another vacant car wash, they had put roll up doors on it and using it for storage. Mm -hmm. So that had given me the idea. So with those kind of life experiences, I knew this would be like a little mini storage building. Mm -hmm. And so working through that with the city and it's in a small town and it should be a good rental property when it's all said and done. That's awesome. So you actually are turning it into a storage unit. Yes, it'll be uh, 12 storage units and opportunity for additional space where more units could be put on the property mm. or possibly some parking or things like that. I'm mm. that's kind of phase two where I'm gonna get the first part done and occupied. Let it, yeah, let it get yeah. It out. Yeah, create some income and then I'll figure out what phase two might look like. That's really cool. What has been um what's been your biggest hurdle in that project so far? Initially it was just getting a survey. In, really? in 2021, it took months to get surveys. I remember that. Unless you're yes. a very experienced company that has access to uh, somebody with lots of volume where you can say, hey, do my project really quickly. Mm -hmm. I am not that size of an investor. So it took months to get a survey. And then at that point, the city said it was something that, yes, you could do a uh, storage building on that. But ultimately, it was up to if the survey wasn't there, the city couldn't make a call. But I needed to buy that property before it was certain. But I just had really good feeling about it that the price I paid, I could always sell it for more yeah i could sell it for more than it was so you closed on it before you had the survey and yeah. confirmed with the city yes interesting and that was something that the city the city said you should get a survey before you close but frankly i think that's when people that aren't investors will tell you sometimes you have to take a calculated risk mm. 
just if you if your experiences and your I had talked to other REN members about this. I had done lots of due diligence even before closing. Gotcha. So I felt like really strongly this was going to be a winner at the at the price of the building. Nice. So okay. again, it's it, the entry price is the most important part when you're buying. You, Talk you, a little bit more about that. So with a lot of times you make money when you buy it. Mm. If you overpay when you buy it, then you're not going to make as much money or any money at the end because that's that's what we can control the most is, is our entry point. Right. And of course, renovation as well. We've made some des- decisions to forego a fence right now just to save some money on budget. Mm-hmm. We came over budget on some other items. So that kind of thing. So I'm certainly looking for more to like in the future to do another commercial renovation. Mm. Where it, where, whether it's a warehouse or maybe another car wash or something like that. That Yeah, the I, car wash is interesting because I think there's this whole new model of car washes, which I'm sure you've seen, like the Camel Express. People pull forward, actually go through the machine, and then they line up and do the vacuum. Mm-hmm. That's the new style versus mm-hmm. that old one, which is just kind of these little squares. Yes. So I could see that, you know, as those start to close down and people go to different ones, I could see that being an opportunity. Remember... So rice peeled. Tyler Cobble, Ren yeah. Ren Commercial member, he did the wash in East Nashville. With, oh, that was Tyler? Yes. I didn't realize that. I yeah. just saw his uh, place. I think they took over, what was it called? Daisy May Hat Co. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just saw his sign over there next to the wash. That's cool. Yeah. So so maybe his office is in that 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 house. That was a title company before mm-hmm. that. That's been owned by Ren members for 10 years. No way. More or less. That's changed stands a few times. Right there on Douglas. Yeah. So, yeah, it, but like in my small town, uh, doing many restaurants would not be a good use mm. for that space. But he saw an opportunity where that would be for the local restaurant scene. Mm-hmm. So you've got to think about like what is the highest and best use. Whereas, again, this was just sitting vacant property. It was actually listed. Mm-hmm. Uh, one bit of alpha I'll share that um, the Tennessee real estate market is fragmented in terms of we as realtors in Nashville, we use Realtrax, multiple yeah. listing service. But uh, Cookville has a different MLS. Knoxville has a different MLS. Chattanooga, really? Memphis. But they cross post though, because I, I can see Chattanooga and Cookville and Knoxville on, on, on Realtrax. Well, it depends if they cross post or not. A, oh. lot do, a lot do not. So you're only seeing a portion of properties. So that's where, like, I have a REN member that is a Cookville realtor. She has me as a buyer. Just oh, cool. getting daily listings. So mm-hmm. at some point, Real Tracks is going to be statewide. Mm-hmm. They've said it's a goal. It's in process right now. But like that that car wash was for sale for years, and just nobody in Nashville even saw it. So that's something where um, my buddy, who's a wholesaler, drove by one day and called the called the uh, se- the agent, the listing agent, and they said, you know, what's the lease you would accept? Which is always a good question to ask mm-hmm. when you're talking to a seller. And it was. Uh, a, n- a number that may, you know, got me interested in it to drive over there and, and do some due diligence with the city. And that's also something else learning from doing developments incorrectly is, again, you've got to focus on due diligence uh, when you get a property under contract to make mm-hmm. sure that everything is as you as they say it is. You get a good meeting with the codes office. And that's also something with smaller towns. They only have one or two people that are the codes deciders. So you just give them a call? Yeah, or just go see them in their office yeah. and, and they'll help you when you come in. And again, small towns, they're just not overburdened with That's growth. a far cry from Nashville. Correct. <laughs> yeah, you call them, they don't answer. You have to send an email two days later, you might get a response. Yes. Yeah. Working That's... working with a, uh, a floodplain lot right now in, in East Nashville, mm-hmm. 207, It's uh, it's been months and there's a meeting in in April with the Board of Zoning Appeals, and then there'll be a meeting with the Stormwater Review Committee in May. These kind of things, this is one of the reasons why real estate is so expensive mm. in, in Nashville and metro areas, just with the time it takes. So that that's costing the developer money to figure out things and be able to build and stuff like that, so. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'm looking at the questions we prepared. I think we've about covered everything uh, I have. What um, I wanted to ask you one sure. one thing you you mentioned um, wealth building in 2023. That's something you want to keep looking at. How do you look at wealth building long term versus short term? We we talked about you first. You've got to have a budget, mm-hmm. so you're you're definitely saving money. Okay. And, and and this then, is just like from your job. So yes. I say probably a lot of REN members are starting out. Just yes. they still have their full time W two yes. income. Most REN members have two or less properties. Interesting. And a, a few, of course, have a lot mm-hmm. that, that we both know and have met. Uh, so, yeah, job income. 
I, I like multiple streams of income. That's something we haven't talked about yet. Yeah, is that let's dig into that. Rental property income is great. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife still has a job and a career. Um, I still have a business where I sell trees and stuff to builders in Nashville. That it's not a full time thing, but it's kind of like a lifestyle thing. That's really cool. It's something that. What's uh, the company called? Well, uh, it was a former rent sponsor, My Landscape Guide, mm. and uh, just have a relationship with builders where McMinnville is where a lot of the trees are grown that that go into like all the landscaping and stuff in Nashville. And Nashville has a mandate where if you build new houses around for like one tree for about every 25 or 50 feet. Mm. So that's just something you're required to do that. So we mentioned landscaping, uh, lending money to other REN members. That's an income stream. Mm -hmm. Uh, Realtor, of course, Mm -hmm. is a big one for me. And uh, and that's know, not something you're really actively prospecting anymore at all, right? It's just No, I, I would still consider myself a full-time realtor. Oh, okay. It's something that, like, I enjoy doing it. Mm. I, I kind of lament sometimes when I see other agents complain about how difficult, you know, it is to work with people. But mm. I think it's really simple kind of thing. You're just not maybe setting the expectations properly with your clients. But I enjoy doing that. Nice. My niche has always been investors, so I love listing renovations or helping people buy dilapidated property mm-hmm. right now I have a client it's a new investor they're they're renovating like a full gut renovation in Tullahoma Tennessee which oh, is yeah. coffee county mm-hmm. and it's more than they thought it was which is we can all laugh about it's always more of course it is. and over budget <laughs> but yeah. um, I feel very confident for them that when they have it finished the comparables that we use were conservative and they're still good today great look about every two three weeks like that market it's a stable market and Tullahoma. it's and it's also a the price point, it's at a home price that people can afford. Mm. What's t- like the average medium home price? There? About 250 250 Yeah. That's, that's still really affordable. Yes. Well, to your point, that's all yeah. relative to you. But. The, uh, we talk about this on the market update. I feel like I've learned this from REN members. If you're investing in homes below the median price, mm-hmm. you should be very safe. Mm. You could always sell them if you needed to. Right. When you're investing and, and doing investment deals and homes that are more like luxury priced Mm -hmm. that might be a little bit more difficult to exit out of if you needed liquidity Mm -hmm. from one of your properties but if you're under the median home price you should be very safe both from a rental standpoint as far as cash flow and then also as a resale and that makes sense because there's more buyers you know exactly people people are always going to need to move people get pregnant people change jobs and then yeah that price point is a little a little easier to achieve. Following the builder market for several years, it's almost impossible to build entry-level homes now. The The land costs are too expensive. The building materials are too expensive. We're Do you mean in Nashville or across the board? Nashville, Williamson County, yep. even Rutherford to some exp- some extent, which I know... little quarter-acre lots are selling for like 350 mm-hmm. 400 depending on the area. So it's difficult to have... A, it's kind of a townhouse is now the entry-level home. Yeah. And they're still a lot more expensive than what they were several years ago. So again, if, if you can have like a brick ranch kind of home that's worth under the median home price, you have a very safe asset in my in my in my view. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. So I've always tried to cater towards that kind of niche. I love homes under a hundred thousand dollars. I think that it's harder to lose your your shirt mm-hmm. if you make a mistake. There's a little more room for error yeah. there. Whereas you start doing this new home construction in Nashville as a REN member, it's just mm-hmm. fraught with risk. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you needing to exit over a half million dollars on, on a home that, you know, may go out of style or this or that. My personal risk tolerance, I don't like that. I'd rather do lots of smaller gotcha. investment deals than one big development kind of deal like that. You're a volume investor. I would say I'm still, I'm still smaller in that. I only buy and sell a few homes a year, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, I try to make those really lucrative for my portfolio. Mm -hmm. Things that I feel like could help me achieve that lifestyle that I'm looking to do, like that uh, car wash conversion. Mm -hmm. I think that'll cash flow like a duplex or a triplex when it's all said and done. It should be a good investment. It's not going to be life changing, but at the same time, it's helping me get towards my goal of Mm -hmm. having passive income so I can just spend more time doing what I want to do. That makes sense. And every every investment doesn't have to be life-changing as long as you're kind of chipping away mm-hmm. at it. It's yes. like eating the elephant one bite at a time, yes. right? I try not to use that income that I'm accruing from investments 
to live on. That makes sense. M- mostly it's my realtor income still that I'm using to fund my lifestyle. But at the same time, uh, I want to be able to, uh, you know, get a bigger snowball and keep mm-hmm. building that so that I, I'm very happy with where I am. Like when I started 10 years ago, I would have been thrilled to be where I am now. Mm-hmm. So I think as like as newer REN members, you've got to be willing to put in the work and the time and just be consistent. And, and you'll be very happy with where you are in a few years making these decisions you're making now. It doesn't feel in the moment, but I, I heard this once of Grace, you and I sitting in the studio today, like this is from decisions we made two, three years ago. Yes. That we, we're yes. in this moment right now. So decisions we're making right now will, will further that path towards where we want to be in the future. And that's so true. Um, I'm actually learning that real time right now. Have you read The Gap in the Gain by any chance? I have not. No, it's a really good book. If you have the chance, it's a do you do audible? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Get it on audible. It's it's life changing, but it's really what you're saying. It's measuring yourself in the gain instead of the gap. So we could always look and say, oh, gosh, I'm not there yet. Like I have this cash flow goal and I'm not here yet. That's really frustrating. And I still battle that every day. But measuring yourself in the gain is like, okay, yeah, two years ago, we couldn't have been sitting here saying this. So this is actually very exciting and we're proud of ourselves, even though the steps that we've taken may not be as big as we thought they would be. Um, I think that's just life though. Everybody measures themselves against who they're not. Yes. And it's like, as long as you're making progress, that's what matters. Yes. Yeah. Because to be honest, in the moment, sometimes I'm not where I want to be. But Mm -hmm. again, I reflect on where I was and maybe read an old journal entry or something like that. And I'm very pleased with with things where they are now, but at the same time, I'm, I don't want to be complacent. Yes. And uh, another plug to Ren is when I hang out with my family, I feel very successful. I feel very comfortable. But when I go hang out at Ren, I feel a little bit inadequate. I can totally relate to that. a little lazy. Oh, I go there and I'm like, what am I doing? I need to step it up. Yeah, I totally need to step it up. So that's, that's another thing you, we're aligning ourselves with high achievers and that makes us all better yes and ellie and i are talking a lot about ren and i think we touched on it earlier ren is real estate investors of nashville it's a a chapter of a larger you know organization called ria it's real estate investors association and it's an american company not company it's an american uh group that investors all over the country get together in their own cities and they talk about things so even if you don't live in nashville don't feel like you can't kind of tap into this you we can, definitely have members in most states do we even in nashville yes really yeah, yeah. do and they Brian, tap into our meetings they they do the zoom meetings uh they're plugged in they get like our newsletter every month um ren because people nashville is becoming more of a global kind of real estate market there's definitely people who are buying that don't live in tennessee especially like the short-term rentals yeah that that's we a huge that we know market. about you know that are own uh investor occupied mm-hmm. Uh, or non-owner N-O-O's, occupied. Yes, yeah. yeah. Non-owner, non-owner occupied, occupied, where it's just a turnkey asset for them. Yep. It's part of their portfolio where we think, wow, that's a really high-end property. They think, yeah, it's just another you know, day at the park for them. A hundred percent. So yeah, you, you guys can even tap into our group personally, uh, virtually, or you can come visit us. But yeah, if you live in another city, most, I would say most major cities have a RIA. Yes. I don't know about, I don't know about every city, but go Google and you'll find it. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like that. We're pretty close to wrapping up. Ooh, I had a couple of follow-up questions. What is one thing that you wish every real estate investor understood? Just how to analyze property. Okay. Correctly. I think we have all seen emails and listings in the Facebook group about property that's just way overpriced Mm -hmm. or someone's looking to get out of a property but they're looking for a greater fool it's just to be ethical and mm-hmm. and and not try to take advantage of other people and that's another plug to ran is it's a group of ethical investors we, we're capitalists but at the same time we're not looking to scam and defraud others yes so we want to if we sell something we want it to be a good deal for the buyer as well 100 percent. and i think people will naturally be weeded out who are doing that um, at, the, at the main meeting last couple of weeks ago, they were saying, yeah, there are a couple of bad actors occasionally, but mm-hmm. they don't last very long. This True. is a place where people care about each other long term. They actually care about the relationship going mm-hmm. forward. So, yeah, that's that's an interesting you know, point. Ren members help each other. That's one thing you, you gave me a thought on, Grace. Uh, mm-hmm. Back to the market. 2023 right now, because there's less transactions going on, it's definitely going to weed out 
the poor actors in terms of investors, realtors, mm-hmm. mortgage lenders, title companies, home inspectors, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a likely thing we'll see this year is some people getting out of real estate oh, just, yeah. just because can... it's difficult and they can't manage their lifestyle based on their income streams. 100%. Um, Grant, do you remember Sean talking about that the other day? How many people haven't renewed their memberships or license? It was a really, I cannot remember right now, but yeah, Sean, our, yeah, ha, of realtors haven't renewed their, their memberships for the year. Yeah. So I think you're right. There were, there were a lot of people that kind of got in for the easy money mm-hmm. and, uh, and it was pretty easy if you knew somebody, mm-hmm. they might sell with you and there were so many deals going on, but yeah, now you really have to work at it and be patient. I think the, the work that realtors do in a transaction, you know, is the most minuscule part of what we what we offer what do you think is the majority of it it's relationship building and guidance Mm -hmm. and making sure somebody's getting a property that they really want and that's what was so unfortunate about like the mania of 2020 and 2021 people were buying homes they didn't really want they just wanted to live somewhere i know so now buyers have a little bit of time they can sleep Mm -hmm. on it which is great great for buyers right now even though it's technically a seller's market there's only about three, four months of inventory, still technically a seller's mm-hmm. market. Buyers definitely are able to sleep on it. That being said, though, there's still multiple offers. A friend of mine in East Nashville, their next door neighbor's house sold the first day. There's still homes being sold quickly if they're priced right. Oh, yeah, they, they definitely are. But it's in certain neighborhoods, things will sit for a couple of weeks. And mm-hmm. yeah, people actually can shop around now. Um, people were waiving inspections. People were buying things that they didn't like or didn't have the money for. Yeah, it's, and you know, they got in at a low interest rate. Granted, the price was inflated, but mm-hmm. I don't know. There's, there are pros and cons to every market, but I'm with you. I'm telling people right now, if you can afford it, if this is a good deal. I was just talking with Will Coleman uh, from Urban Gate Capital mm-hmm. about this on Monday. And mm-hmm. I'm saying, if you can afford it, you're not going to go underwater. This is a really great moment to try and pick something up. Because real estate prices, especially in Nashville, are going to continue to go up in the long term. So if you're not trying to flip this house in like six months, I would say just go for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good deal. Real estate wasn't meant to be like an investment vehicle at first. You know, it was more of Do you mean in its inauguration? Yeah, I just mean in a way it's real estate was meant to be like that's your shelter. That's your base. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of been with the low interest rates, it became an investment product like with the large institutional hedge fund buyers and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. But that's all kind of a product of the financial system we're in. Right. But yeah, as investors, we've got to be careful about that. But yeah, it's as we cater to our, our, our realtor clients. Yes. I think it needs to be a thought of hold for the long term. Mm -hmm. I tell most of my clients that I'm like, if you want to sell in two years, the prices are, are kind of at their peak right now. To your point, they're softening, but yeah, I, I wouldn't buy with the thought of dropping in another year or two. We get into trouble say. when we predict where the market's going. Yes. I had a first time home buyer on the phone last week that we didn't have a pre existing relationship mm-hmm. that he wanted me to tell him that this home was gonna be worth more money in a year or two and we, we just can't say because no. we don't we don't know. We don't know. Yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna put my word on the line like that because I don't have a crystal ball. Yeah. People thought that things were going to keep going up Mm -hmm. in 2007, 2008. That being said, because of scarcity and land costs and things like that, I think there's a narrative for, Mm -hmm. I think prices are going to remain stable. That's my personal conviction. But if they did go down, I just wouldn't sell properties as long as my tenants are paying rent. Right. Because the rents are unlikely to go down much if they did it all. Mm -hmm. And again, people have to have some place to live. And that utility is what really makes real estate special. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree. Well, I know we're running up on your time, but is there anything you want to close out with and share with the community? Come come to Wren. We, we do a main event on the second Monday of the month. We have breakout sessions. We have networking. There are other meetups across the month, whether they're networking lunches or other meeting focus groups in other counties. There's a meeting for everybody. Yeah. There's women's brunches. Those yeah. are my favorite. Uh, it's the fourth week fourth Tuesday morning of every month. Nice. Yeah. So you're making an effort to go to that one oh, every yeah. month. I love that one. I would just encourage people be intentional and just go consistently. You make more friends. I can remember when I was new at Wren, I didn't know a lot of people. It was mm-hmm. uncomfortable, but 
Uh, we on the board at Wren are doing our best to make it welcoming and a big tent for everybody. So there's so many niches and ways to make money in real estate too. No matter what you've read about on the internet, what style of investor you want to be, there's somebody at Wren doing that. Yes. And there's power in meeting that person and hearing about what they think. And people that come to Wren also share. Mm-hmm. And that's that's powerful. It's not a group of people who are trying to. They're not trying to hide it under a, exactly. uh, under a bushel. Yeah. I've learned so much that, again, because I didn't have a real estate background, I wouldn't be where I am today without real estate investors in Nashville. Wow. Boom. Let's end it right there. That's awesome. Thank you, Elliot. Thanks for you. Appreciate your time. Thank you.